afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for taking a little time for your busy Christmas schedules to join us for this very important webinar. My name is Barbara Carter. I'm in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island. I was diagnosed with scleroderma in 2001, and I do have Raynaud's and I do have hand issues. So this webinar is a particularly uh, an important topic for me. Um, scleroderma affects our hands and it can be a very painful and life altering experience. So I'm sure these ladies today will be able to offer us wonderful information and some helpful hints as to how to deal with the hand issues. The name of this webinar of course today is getting a hand getting a grip on scleroderma hands. There will be a question and answer period at the end of this webinar where you can put your questions into the Q&A at the top of your screen. I'd like to also thank our sponsors, the Government of Canada's Emergency Community Support Fund, as well as the Community Foundation of Nova Scotia. Our speakers today are Jan Mitty of the Reynolds Association, and Linda Quackenboss, I think I said that right, co-founder of the Scleroderma Patient-Centered Intervention Network, or commonly known as SPIN. I'll hand the floor over now to Jan to start us off. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me here today um, from the Reynolds Association. And I hope that the information I provide for you will really be beneficial. Um, I too have scleroderma since 2002, and I have um, hand issues as well as internal organ issues and skin. So I've lived with Reno since I was first diagnosed. It was my first sign. Um, so that's where I'd like to begin. I think um, a lot of us really don't understand or didn't understand when we were first diagnosed how Raynaud's actually happens. And to understand that, we're gonna get a little, a little bit into biology. We have in our, in our bodies a tool and the tool is used to help us protect ourselves from things that we might be afraid of or things that give us stress. We have an autonomic nervous system and in there are three branches. One of the branches is called the sympathetic nervous system. And what it is, it's actually called, another name for it is called fight or flight response. And what happens is when our body feels threatened by some kind of, um, maybe for example, it could be they're threatened that they need to invite a person or it could be just getting up and speaking in front of an audience. There's certain things that happen inside the body Thank you for that slide. <laughs> Sorry about that. So again, we have an autonomic nervous system and there are three branches. The branch we're gonna talk about is the sympathetic nervous system and it's called the fight or flight response. There's a typo there. And what happens is our body gets ready to engage in a threat or to run away from something and what it looks like is our heart rate increases, our pupils dilate, our blood sugar levels may increase, hormones, et cetera. But the main thing that I wanna call your attention to is that our veins in our skin constrict to send more blood to the core to protect the vital organs. So that means you have less blood going to the extremities to keep them warm. Could you go to the next slide, please? So what is Raynaud's? It's actually an exaggerated version of this fight or flight response where you visually see these color changes. And from the picture up there, you can see how the, the fingers are white and then the palms are red. When I was first diagnosed, I had um, a very severe case. My hands turned completely black. And then, and just from getting out of the shower, from going from a hot shower to uh, being in a room. And after a while, they would turn a little purple and then they would red and then they would come back to um, the normal color. But the normal triad of color changes is usually white as the blood flows out of the digits 
and then blue from the lack of oxygen and then red as the blood flows back into normal. There are all different types of Raynaud's attacks. That's just the, the common triad. And the best thing I would do, I have to say, is it's very hard to explain them. When I was first diagnosed, I couldn't explain how black they were. So I took a picture of it. And I brought it with me to the doctor and I said, this is what my hands look like. And then we started to talk about Raynaud's and if that was a possibility, what was going on with me. My uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so what causes Raynaud's? There is primary and secondary forms. Primary is for no underlying reason. For example, I have a friend, he's a runner. He has Raynaud's. I'll be like, you have Raynaud's. Oh, no, I don't. Raynaud's happens for unknown reasons. And that's what it's called primary. Secondary is when it's from another disease, commonly an autoimmune disease. So people with, for example, scleroderma, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, those are just to name a few of the diseases that might have Raynaud's as a secondary condition. I just, okay, could you go back just for one second? Thank you. I used to think that it was a very rare disease and that not many people had it. Well, if you look at the bottom of the slide here, it says 10, five to 10% 10 of the US population have it, which is 15 to 30 million. Well, we have 328 million, right, in the US. So that's not really a rare condition. And there's 90% of them don't even know that they have it. A lot of people are just like, oh, my hands are so cold all the time. And they don't realize that they problems here. So here we go. No, same one. Same one. Well, I'm going to talk about it. And when we figure that out, it'll all come together. There you go. There. So Raynaud's can affect any extremity. For example, we all know the hands, toes, the ears. I've had ulcers on my ears. In my nose, outside my nose, I get Raynaud's attacks. Some people even get it on their tongue. Women can get it on their breasts and even sex organs. Now, you would think that this would be a vascular um, condition or circulation condition, but actually 90% of the people that have brain nodes have normal vascular function and circulation. Next slide. Now, how do you diagnose brain nodes? There's no formal test, but there are things that um, you can try and see if your doctor will do. The first thing is, is um, he wants to look at symptoms. One of the tests that were done for me was, it was a, called a cold water trigger test, where they take your hands and actually stick your hands in a cold basin of water for about 30 seconds, take it out and they look for an attack. Not necessarily does that work all the time, but that's one of the tests they might use to try and trigger an attack. Another, another form of diagnosis might be through thermal imaging. However, with that, you have to be having an attack for it to pick up on it. Now, there is also a blood test called an anti-nuclear antibody test. You may know it as an ANA test. And that, if it comes up positive, could, could, I have to stress, could mean that there is a secondary condition causing you to have the Raynaud's attack. So a rheumatologist, if your ANA is positive, they would or they should um, do a full ANA profile to see if you have any of the autoimmune listed that occur with a positive ANA. Next slide, please. Raynaud's is a medical condition. And this is where I think there's a lot of misunderstanding from family and friends, uh, just based on my experience. Um, this is where you really have to engage yourself. So for example, 
people may see you as complaining, oh, you're so cold, you're always cold. Um, and that may actually be upsetting to you and that might even cause you to have a longer Raynaud's attack because Raynaud's is, is triggered not just from temperature changes but from stress and from lifestyle. So it is a medical condition, but there are things that we can do outside of medication that can help it to minimize our attacks. And we will talk a little bit about that later. Next. <clears throat> okay, treatments for Raynaud's. Now, in, I live in New Jersey. I live in, in Florida, but I used to live in New Jersey. And we have different insurance than I think that you do in other countries. So I just wanna stress that you should check with your rheumatologist or your insurance company to see what's covered. But there is medication out there that can increase blood flow to the extremities. For example, calcium channel blockers. I'll give you an example, Procardia, um, Alonapine. There are erectile dysfunction drugs. Sedenafil, which is really a female version of Viagra. And to, to Sedenafil, which is Cialis, another ED medication. In addition to that, there are anti-anxiety medications, for example, Prozac. So when I was first diagnosed, my rheumatologist put me on Prozac and he put me on Viagra because I started to develop ulcers. And the Viagra was amazing how well it worked. And at the time, Sedenafil wasn't out in the market. So I was lucky enough to get that from my doctor. But um, now that Sedenafil is available in the United States for digital ulcers, hopefully that's something that you might be able to get. And I have to say it worked very well. I take 20 milligrams three times a day and it definitely helps with the Raynaud's. But I find that the Prozac helps me more because it's actually an anti-anxiety medication and it, and it helps with my Raynaud's and it also helps with my hot flashes and some cold through menopause. <laughs> so uh, you might wanna consider these as options for medication. There are other treatments, for example, hyperbaric therapy, which is used to help bring more oxygen to the tissues. There's Botox. Um, I've had that done where they've injected right into my hands. I really didn't think it, was, it worked for me, but maybe for someone else it might. A digital sympathectomy is a surgery and that's done where they go in and they actually will manipulate on um, the sympathetic nervous system to constantly dilate and throw blood to the digits. Um, I haven't had that done, but I know people that have and they've told me that um, it can reverse itself. There's illifros injections. That's, you can get that now actually in infusions or in a nebulizer. And that's, you can go in the hospital for that. And that might help with, if you're in danger of losing a digit. There's also self-help te help techniques. And that would be, for example, breathing exercises. One of the best breathing exercises I've learned is when you take four deep breaths in, you hold it for five, and then you take four deep breaths out. It's very calming and it helps with stress. I went, I went, I've been doing yoga for many years and it's been recommended by many, many people. There are also natural and holistic remedies, not clinically verified. And you do need to check with your physician if you're gonna to start to, to take supplements. But I can tell you some of the diet food that I eat, not diet food that help me are oranges, nuts, pumpkin seeds, watermelon, blackberries, cayenne pepper, omega-3s, garlic, and ginkgo biloba. So you can, if you Google foods that increase circulation, you might find additional ones. Those are the ones that work for me. I just wanted to share that with you. Next slide. So what are your triggers? When I first lived in New Jersey, the winters would kill me. I would become a hermit. I would stay in the house. I would, I, it was really a horrible experience for me. I was so afraid of going out, even though I had all my gear on. And so I said, well, let me go and move to Florida. 
Well, I was misunderstood about that because it's any exposure to cold, meaning air conditioning, anything outdoors. I mean, you could get a little chill, swimming, cold water, holding a glass of water. I remember one time I was on vacation in the islands and it was 95 degrees out. I picked up a cold glass, my whole hand went purple. So, it, you know, it's really, it's very conditional and very individualized. When I go to the supermarket, if you have to reach into the freezer, you know, there's all different triggers. The best thing is to just really know your triggers. Because if you know them, then you can help minimize your exposure to them. You know, some people think it's dramatic temperature changes. I can get a chill and have a rain attack. You could go obviously from house to cold, but there might just be little things, little changes that could cause it. Sometimes it's going from hot to cold even. And the last one of course is stress. I can't explain um, in detail. I wish I could spend a whole presentation on stress because I'm doing research on it now, but there's so many stress factors that can cause you to have a Raynaud's attack. It could be work, someone at work, your work that you do, your family, outside your family, your friends. It could be traveling. It could even be the holidays. You're dealing with health issues. That could be a trigger. You have to watch your stress and sleep disturbances. If I don't get enough sleep the next day, my brain nose is really very, very aggressive. Next. Okay, trigger prevention. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm still suffering from laryngitis. First thing is to keep warm, obviously, and dress for each day. So what I do is the, the night before I know where I'm going, I will pack a bag and I might put gloves in there, a hat, keep a coat in my car, sweater, have extra socks. I dress in layers. It's really important to keep your core and your head warm, okay? So what I do is I'll bring these kind of supplies. I can take hand warmers and I have a muff that wraps around my neck. And in the muff, I put the hand warmers. The muff lays right on my core. So I get heat that way. So I can always put my hands in my muff or I'm getting heat right on my belly in that case too. I have battery operated gloves that I use. I have battery operated hand warmers that I have. We all have information. We have additional information on the Raynaud's Association page, but there's a lot of different supplies that you can bring with you. And then again, supplements, please check with your doctor first and then find ways to reduce your stressors. Again, breathing, meditation, exercise, of course, increases circulation, therapy, when I think of therapy, I think of therapy of the mind, the body, and the spirit. So it's not just therapy, occupational or physical therapy, it's actually mind uh, therapy for your mind and your spirit. You know, how, are you, how do you feel about yourself? Are you handling the changes you're going through? What can you do? Who can you talk to? Can you communicate with your caregivers? Um, there's a lot of different ways for you to get support. You just have to reach out and find out what you need support with. Next. Okay, I put this slide up here because I think it's important for us to understand that there are a lot of populations that suffer with digital ulcers. And these numbers don't represent that everyone listed here has digital ulcers. This is just the population in total that could get them. So there's scleroderma on top 300,000, right? In the US. But if you look down the line, there's eczema, Raynaud's associated, uh, there's um, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, even frostbite is in there. So we're not alone in this, um, in this fight with digital ulcers. And it kind of is a little bit, makes me feel a little bit, bit better that there are others that are suffering. So maybe I'll go to the RA website and see what they're doing for their ulcers and their Raynaud's, or I'll go and look at, you know, type two diabetes. There's a lot of money in, invested in diabetes. How are they helping their patients get over the ulcers? Which brings us to now talking about ulcers. Next slide. Okay, digital ulcers. 
They usually start off as small sores that form on the fingers and toes as a result of lack of blood flow. They can look round like a little open sore in the skin. In the early stages, there might be skin discoloration in the area, it might be visible. Sometimes I'll have an ulcer which I can't even see and it will just hurt in one area of my finger or my toe. And I'll be like, there's nothing there, there's nothing there. And then in the, a week later, there comes this, the callus form, which we, I see before my ulcer opens up. The outer border may be raised and thick. It may look warm, I mean, feel warm or look red. And these ulcers, we have to understand, are, are very prone to infection and are very slow to heal due to poor blood circulation. I have an ulcer on my elbow. I've had it for 10 years. And it'll heal, and then it'll come back. And it will heal, and it'll come back. So we really want to pay attention to our ulcers because they will affect our mo mobility if they get bad enough, especially in the joint areas. In some cases, surgery may be required to remove the infected regions. We have to be careful that we don't stay in the state of Raynaud's on our digits or our toes or anywhere because that means compromised, the blood is being compromised for a length of period that should not be as long as we want it to. And the last point is just that people with systemic sclerosis like myself, we get ulcers on many joint areas. I have ulcers on my elbows, my knees, my ankles, my ears, my nose, basically everywhere on a joint area and our, our ex extremity, you can get ulcers if you have systemic diffuse. You might, not if. Next slide. So these are some of the pictures of my own hands. Um, I'd like to start with the one on the left-hand side, multiple ulcers and calluses on a single finger. So if you look at my thumb, there's a lot of patchy little hard areas. And if you notice, some are raised, some are not. So this is just to give you an idea of like the first initial stage of sun. Now, if you look down to the lower picture, also on the side of the head from trauma, you can get ulcers from trauma too, from leaning or using what I find is my ulcers hurt, so I might use a different part of my hand to help compensate for the lack of use of where the ulcer is. So I developed one on the outside of my pinky as a result of putting my hand down all the time. Now, the, the, the picture on the right-hand side, I'd like to actually go to the next slide so we can really look at this ulcer. This ulcer extends from the tip all the way around the cuticle of the finger. Now, you might think that the pain would be isolated just to where the ulcer is, but it is not. It extends all the way around the cuticle and almost down to the joint. It was very inflamed, there was swelling. I went to the doctor. He said, well, it doesn't really look infected. We'll keep an eye on it. I couldn't use it. I couldn't find any relief. And eventually I went back to the doctor and it was so small and red that he put me on an antibiotic and I was able to not lose any skin on this finger and heal, but everything did, I did lose the old skin with new skin forming underneath. So how do you care for your ulcers? Next slide. Okay, the first and most important thing is to keep them clean and it's very individualized. I use saline to clean my ulcers. Some people use soap and water. I have a friend of mine, she gets them just on her digits, she uses warm soaks. Some do it with oatmeal because it soothes the inflammation and others recommend betadine and water. I don't believe in anything that's gonna dry the skin out too much. So I find that the saline works best for me, but it's really a preference. And then you have to protect them. What kind of bandage are you going to use? Um, um, are you gonna use cotton wrap? Are you gonna use um, gauze with elastic tape? How are you putting on your bandages? Are you using gloves? Are you using your hands? Are your hands clean? And then what are you putting on the ulcer before you wrap it? 
There's vitamin E works. I use lidocaine as a, um, it's not an antibiotic cream, but it helps to numb the area a little bit. You can get Neosporin over the counter that has a little bit of lidocaine. The biggest thing I find with my ulcers is I try to protect them from trauma and keep the area moist, not too dry. The trauma actually aggravates them and prolongs healing, especially on fingers that you use a lot. And again, another, another treatment option is the medications. I'm not gonna go through them again, they're there, but we didn't talk about nitroglycerin patches um, and, and there are creams, nitroglycerin creams, where you put them around the ulcer, not in the ulcer to help bring blood flow to the area. There's a prescription you have to ask for your doctor. I don't know if you're, they're covered in where you are, but I was able to get that where I live. Next, please. Okay, so who are your caregivers? <clears throat> I have to say that I have 17 doctors and I communicate with all of them, meaning when I go to see them, I bring my last labs, I bring any kind of x-rays, CAT scans, any information that I have that I, because you're entitled to all your information from your doctor, I bring with me. Because how can you give them the whole picture if you don't have, if you don't know the whole picture? So I think it's very important that you understand that your, your doctor is really, he is a caregiver. The more information you give him, the better he can help you. My pharmacist, my pharmacist knows me by name. I call her for everything. Um, and we constantly are in communication about new medications or if I'm having side effects or if she thinks I might have side effects, I call her with supplement information. And then therapists, again, I have a physical therapist, occupational therapist, and a mental therapist. They're both very important to be considered caregivers because they help you. Like my occupational therapist helped me um, fix my car so that I could drive it. I couldn't put my seatbelt on. He showed me how to do that. I couldn't get around the kitchen. He came. We, we, we bought tools for around the kitchen. We found ways of allowing me to feel different things on, on, on the microwave so that I could select certain <coughs> options. There's also your church and your community, your family. Your family are your caregivers. And I find it's very important for me to always be grateful and thanking them. I try to do as much as I can by myself. But we do need to lean on our family for many different ways and our friends at work. You know, when I was working, I had, um, I had asked for um, a heater underneath my desk. And it took a little while, but I was able to get it. And it really made a difference in my ability to work. And everyone understood. And it was okay. So if you're having problems at work with being warm, you have the right to say that that's happening and they should respond based on the American Disabilities Act. And then support groups. We have a great support group here in Florida. It's made up of all people with scleroderma and then some come and go. And we help each other in many different ways. We get together, we do Zoom yoga. We um, have our meetings. We have some meetings on mental, some meetings are on physical. Um, discussions. So you are the focal point for all your caregivers and it really is our responsibility to communicate with all of them. I, I think this is the most important slide of all because if after have, having disease for 21 years, I don't know where I would be at times if I didn't have all these caregivers there to help me during times when I was not in remission. Next. Uh, this is a great story. I'm, I'm so happy that I, that I can share this with you because this just happened to me last week. Um, going to the ER now with COVID is very scary and it's nerve wracking and nobody really wants to go to the ER because they're afraid they're gonna be in, in um, contact with somebody that does. But I had to go to um, 
the ER to get a COVID test the other day. And then right after that, I had to go into a same day surgery to get an endoscopy. So I knew I was going for a COVID test. So I packed a bag. I bought, I wore extra warm clothes. I bought a robe, slippers, a heating pad. Believe it or not, they will let you bring a heating pad in there. I had my hand warmers, my gloves, my phone charger, I had creams. And then I walked in and they wanted to take my vitals and my hands were freezing. And the first thing they said was, let's see, let's get a pulse oxygen reading out of you. I don't know if you guys are familiar with what that is, is they put this little instrument on your finger and they try and find out how much oxygen is flowing in your blood. Well, for people with ray nodes, we don't have a lot of oxygen going through our blood. And if we're freezing, it's even worse. So I said to the nurse, I go, I don't think you're gonna get an oxygen reading on my finger. You might wanna try between the web space of my index finger and my thumb. So we tried there, still couldn't get it. So then we went to my ear and we were actually able to get an oxygen reading on the ear. Now it was time to take blood. Now for me, when I'm cold, my veins were horrible, they're all scarred and it was freezing in there. I said, the best thing you, I, we can do right now for you and for me is to get me some warm blankets. So they brought me warm blankets. I was still freezing. It was so cold in there. So I said to the nurse, I go, do you have a bear hugger here? And they're like, I think we might have one. Let me go check. So let me tell you what a bear hugger is. It's usually used in pre and post-op surgeries, but it's a blanket and it's, it's not a cloth blanket. And what they do is they attach this hose to it and the hose blows hot air through the whole blanket and it warms your whole body. And when I tell you, when they put that bear hugger on me, we were, she was able to get, keep the pulse ox meter on me. They got my blood. I was warm. I wasn't freezing. I was talking. I wasn't in pain. It was the best thing they ever did. So when they prepared me to go into the endoscopy um, room, they had another bear hug waiting for me because they communicated that she needs a bear hugger during the procedure. And then when I woke up after I had my endoscopy, I was still in a bear hugger. So all I can say is if you go to the ER, ask for a bear hugger if the warm blankets aren't work. You won't, you won't believe the relief. I felt so much more relief when I was warm. I was intense. They got my blood. It was just a wonderful experience. So keep that in mind if you have to go to the ER or to the hospital or to a same day surgery center. You can call ahead too if you have to. Next slide. So this is about the Reynolds Association. We, um, what we do is we do a lot of different things. We have a newsletter that comes out quarterly and people send us, with, they send us in, uh, tools, gloves, creams, and we test them. And if we like them, we put them on our website, the website, and then you get discounts as a member. You can get, you can get discounts on hand warmers, on creams. We have a lot of great articles that are going out. We have discussion forums and we have a support service. You can call anytime and speak with Lynn Wonderman. She's the CEO and founder of the Reynolds Association. And we are here to help in so many different ways. We're on Facebook as well. If you go to the last slide now, this is our website, www.reynolds.org. And here are some of the social forums you can find us. And if you want, if you're benefited from anything that you've heard today, or you want to go on the site, if you want to make a donation, we use the donations obviously for education and for testing new products. And I thank you for your time. I'm sorry I have a little laryngitis and that's why I sound a little hoarse, but I'm glad to have presented and I hope I've helped in some way. Thank you so much, Jan. You have helped, I'm sure, immensely. There's not too many people with scleroderma that can't relate to the hand issues and the Raynaud's 
it is definitely an ongoing battle for most of us. Your information is worth its weight in gold. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to uh, state here that there will be time at the end of this webinar for the question and answer period. So we can ask all of our questions then. I'd like to turn the remainder of this webinar over to Linda. Thank you very much. First thing always is to uh, try and figure out how to share your screen. I think um, you should be able to uh, see it now. Um, so, so thank you for, uh, for the um, uh, interesting information also, uh, Jan, and um, for having me here today. We were just discussing before we started this webinar that it's actually um, good that we're doing this online because I am currently in the Netherlands uh, where I live oh. and right now we're like able to, um, without travel, be present for these, uh, for these meetings and share our information uh, all together. So if you're wondering why it's so dark, it's uh, 7, uh, 7.30 here um, uh, p.m. So, uh, so that's why I'm a little bit in the dark. Um, so today I am going to speak about the Scleroderma Patient Centered Intervention Network Hand Exercises Program, or the SPIN Hand Program. <clears throat> I'm actually really excited to present this uh, today because it is, if you're familiar with SPIN, the first SPIN toolkit, the first educational in, uh, toolkit uh, online that we have available for you to use. So after today's webinar, you can go online, you can actually uh, see the Spin Hand Toolkit live, try it out uh, by yourself or with your healthcare provider. But before we uh, do that, or before you that, do that, hopefully, let me first introduce a little bit about what Spin is and how this uh, Spin Hand Exercises program came together. Um, and I'll start by telling a little bit of a background on the SPIN story. So SPIN stands for Scleroderma Patient Centered <coughs> Intervention Network. Um, and uh, I think the uh, patient centered part uh, is really important, but also of course the network part, because we are a global uh, group of people trying to um, help uh, people living with scleroderma. Um, if you look back at the SPIN story, uh, SPIN was established in 2011, and um, um, when we looked at information that was available to any people with living with rare diseases, we found that at first, a lot of people ha are having difficulty getting diagnosed, and you may uh, recognize this, uh, of course. Um, but then once people are being diagnosed with scleroderma or another rare disorder, um, there's often not a lot of effective treatments or support programs. Um, and these kind of programs are actually available to people with more common diseases. So this is really a difference between being diagnosed with a rare disease such as scleroderma uh, or one of the almost uh, 7,000 other rare diseases versus with being diagnosed with a more common disease such as diabetes or rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, Jan had a couple of, uh, of them on there her screen as well, um, where there are more like effective treatments, more support programs available. And back in 2011, um, we brought together a group of people who thought that this would really change. We should really do something about this, not only raising awareness for a more accurate diagnosis, which is something that a lot of patient organizations, of course, are busy with, but also do something about the treatment options, support programs available to people living with scleroderma. So what kind of support programs are we actually talking about? If you think about more common diseases, then medical uh, care includes not only medications, treatments to, um, to treat the, um, the disease itself or its symptoms, but also things like patient education, where can you get information about your uh, disease? Self-management tools that may actually help you um, manage pain, manage fatigue, manage your healthcare uh, system and, and healthcare providers, um, as well as managing the emotional consequences of your disorder. In this case, of course, the, the rare disorder is scleroderma. Um, and psychological support is also available. How do you cope with changes to your, uh, to your appearance? How can you cope with the emotions that come from living with scleroderma, such as maybe like fear for the future uh, or maybe anger because this happened to you, etc. And then the last uh, thing that is also really important is the physical rehabilitation. So the physical therapy, occupational therapy um, interventions that can help you 
um, keep as mobile as possible and has a, have as good as a quality of life uh, as possible as well. And we know that uh, quite some people with scleroderma are getting uh, physical and occupational therapy, but often people um, in like the local community, physical and occupational therapists, they haven't seen many people with scleroderma, of course, because it is so rare. So what is SPIN and what are we doing? Well, I already mentioned that the network part is, part is really important. It is really an international collaboration of people living with scleroderma who are really driving us. Um, patient organizations uh, such as Scleroderma Atlantic, um, researchers as well as healthcare professionals. And our mission, the mission of this whole group is to develop, test and disseminate all these kind of like support tools that I just spoke about to people around the world who live with scleroderma. And we want to do this, uh, make this ex as accessible as possible uh, to, to many people around the globe, uh, free of charge so that you can use it at any time. Uh, and if you haven't heard about SPIN, we have a website, it's uh, listed here uh, below, spinsclero.com. Uh, that you can check out for more information about our projects uh, as well. And uh, you can actually see who is involved um, uh, from your area. So I mentioned that when we first started in 2011, there's not a lot of tools available for people living with scleroderma. And this was really a struggle because if you develop something in the Netherlands, for instance, <laughs> in our local center here, in our local hospital, um, that is nice, of course, for the people living here, living in the Netherlands, but it doesn't do much for people living in Canada. Uh, and if you develop something in Canada, it doesn't necessarily help the people in China a lot who uh, cope with scleroderma. So what we thought is like, we need to make this more global. We need to do this online to maximize accessibility. Uh, and with the COVID-19 pandemic, of course, um, this is uh, something that is really um, uh, more and more emphasized uh, for, for other diseases and other um, support uh, as well. We also thought we need good partnerships with um, um, pa patient organizations, because how are we going to reach the people living with scleroderma? And one way to do this and do this very efficiently is through the patient organizations. The other thing that we thought is that like we can't do this alone. We need an international network. We need to get as much input and information from different centers and different experts as we, ex as, as we can. So we built this international network of clinical research centers from uh, different countries and I have a picture of those, uh, the countries uh, involved uh, in just a little bit. And then one thing, and you may actually be part of this, is that we have a cohort-based research infrastructure to test whether our patient programs are actually uh, effective. So um, I'm going to walk through these four points um, uh, uh, sequentially uh, now to give a little bit more information. So one thing uh, that we emphasize is that we are really working closely with partner organizations around the world. Uh, Scleroderma Canada and its provincial um, uh, organizations. Um, um, we're working with the, the Spanish um, patient organization, the Chinese organization for scleroderma, which is uh, fairly uh, recent, uh, New Zealand, uh, Australia and its provincial um, organizations, but also other initiatives such as uh, Scleroderma Framed uh, and Project Scleroderma that are really more driving uh, awareness for scleroderma. But we think these uh, partner organizations around the world um, are really important for actually getting to know like what, what it is that people living with scleroderma need, um, how we can uh, organize this uh, in, in, the, in the best way uh, to get these support tools and to get these programs to people living with scleroderma. We are also working with more than 50 rheumatologists and other scleroderma clinicians. Uh, and you may recognize some of these uh, people here from previous conferences maybe or, or other webinars uh, that they may have given. So <clears throat> both from uh, Europe, from the US, uh, and, uh, and from, uh, from Canada, we have a lot of uh, people involved dedicating their time to helping us develop these support tools uh, and giving their uh, input and expertise from what they see in the clinic, what they know about their research, etc. Then the other thing that we have is the SPIN cohort. And you may, as I mentioned, be part of this uh, already. And what we thought is that, you know, it's really hard to, um, to really 
understand and get enough information on what is important to people living with scleroderma. You can, of course, ask a couple of people, but to have like good information on what is most the most, what are the most common symptoms, what are the most common problems that people may be experiencing, um, but also what are questions that you may have that we could answer with research. Um, we need a large group of people and not from just one local area, but actually from um, uh, as many countries as possible, because there may, of course, be differences between countries as well. So what we did is we uh, established a SPIN cohort and uh, we have enrolled over 1800 people living with scleroderma. Uh, and you may be one of them who complete measures on quality of life, on hand function, on uh, other forms of uh, physical function, but also on their emotional well-being. Um, uh, online every three months and uh, these people come from seven countries right now and we collect these uh, this information in three languages uh, English French and Spanish and Dutch is, uh, is also coming up and we're looking to expand this of course to uh, get more like, global reach for that and the spin cohort and this is an overview of how we use this information that we're collecting um, so people with scleroderma register for the SPIN cohort with your local healthcare provider in Halifax, that's uh, Evelyn Sutton. Um, and uh, every three months you fill out this measure online. And we're using this information to better understand scleroderma, including what problems are important to you, what may be most impactful in your daily life. The other thing that we're using it for, and this is really important, is that it helps us develop these online tools that I've been speaking about. So it helps us develop a self-management program for living with scleroderma. It helps us inform like what hand pro problems are most important to you, what emotional problems may be most important to you, et cetera. So that is a really important source of information for us to develop these, uh, these tools um, and to uh, further get information uh, from, uh, from people living with the disease and what is really important to you. And then we're also using it to run um, studies to see if our programs are actually having the effect that we are attending it to have. So for instance, if we're looking about the HENT um, uh, program in just a little bit, um, what we do is we uh, offer the HENT program to some people in the cohort to try it out and see if it really does have an effect on their HENT function. Um, I always like to show this picture um, because I keep telling about these like intervention tools, but it's a little bit abstract if you haven't seen them yet. Um, but what we're actually doing is we're developing these online programs that you could use by yourself or with your healthcare professional uh, on hand function that we're going to speak about today, but also like things like coping with daily problems related to the scleroderma. This is the self-management that I spoke about, coping with appearance concerns, coping with the emotional impact, but also like how can you how can you exercise well with scleroderma um, uh, or like what could you do uh, in terms of like diet and nutrition um, for your um, to help your um, uh, GI system function as well as possible. And then we're looking at not just people living with scleroderma, but also support group leaders. And uh, Jan already mentioned that that could be a really important source of information and of uh, support in your um, in your environment. And also like how can we help caregivers of those um, uh, living with scleroderma to, um, um, to help um, them as, um, as much as possible with their caregiving tasks, uh, uh, et cetera. So these are the tools that we're developing right now. Um, and we're not stopping here. We actually uh, do have plans for other programs as well, but of course you need to start somewhere. And these were um, actually topics that people with scleroderma who completed our measures uh, in the cohort or um, who discussed with us from patient organizations thought were most important and um, should really be addressed uh, first. So we prior prioritize these based on um, the information that received from you as the scleroderma community. So this webinar is on hands. So uh, let's, uh, let's move on to the SPIN hand program. And as I mentioned, this is the, the first like, online toolkit that is available to you. Uh, and uh, I have this link uh, here in the, in the slide, but also later on, uh, you can also find it on our SPIN Sclero website. And if you go on to the SPIN hand, um, uh, this website, you can log in, you can use it free of charge. Um, so please do that after 
the webinar and take a look and see uh, how it could uh, help you uh, keep your hands mobile. I think you know more about scleroderma and the hands than I do probably because I am actually a psychologist by training, um, but um, I do know a little bit about like how the, the, the function of your hands can be affected by scleroderma. Um, and uh, I have some, uh, some photos here, um, and you may recognize some of the uh, common uh, symptoms, uh, the contractures, the, the difficulty make, like flattening the hands, uh, etc. Um, actually, someone, uh, a friend I know, know who has scleroderma has helped me uh, make these uh, photos um, so, uh, so that we um, can show like the mobility of the hands, um, this really could be impaired, could be limited. And um, we know that this is a really important cause of disability. Uh, it li just limits your function and it lowers your quality uh, of life if you have uh, significant hand involvement. And while we do know or, or think that the re rehabilitation interventions such as occupational therapy and um, uh, uh, physical therapy could really help um, uh, to, to achieve better physical function or to maintain as much function in your hands as possible uh, and improve uh, health-related quality of life. If you look at the, the evidence or the guidelines for the treatment of scleroderma uh, that people are using, it's actually really hard to find good um, information on what kind of exercises you should be doing. Um, there is not a lot of evidence, uh, not a lot of tested tools to help you um, reduce the limitations in your hand function or to improve it. So that is exactly what the SPIN hand toolkit is intended for. It actually includes four different modules that you could go through at your own pace, at your own time, and they each address a different area of function. And this toolkit was developed with a group of experts uh, um, led by Luc Mouton and uh, uh, Serge Pouredeau, who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. Um, but he, they really dedicated um, their time together with a group of physical therapists, uh, occupational therapists um, to develop these, um, these um, hand exercises. And they said there's four main functions that should be addressed. One is the thumb function because it is really important for grasping and holding objects. So you can probably imagine if you're like grasping a glass, for instance, you really need your thumb function. Making a fist, which is important for holding objects with handles, such as a knife or a fork, um, but also others. Um, finger extension, so whether you can stretch your fingers uh, out. So it's important for things like, as I mentioned here, like using your cell phone or typing on the computer and uh, sometimes we see these contractors, so the finger extension is really limited. Um, and then the wrist uh, extension you see here, like almost like a praying position, but like the ability to, um, um, to, to um, use your wrists and to have them mobile is important also for things like writing, for gardening, etc. So these four modules, they all in address a different area of function in your hand, and they all have different exercises in them. Um, and uh, what we did is that you can probably see, like, you know, for me, I don't have scleroderma, uh, so no hand involvement uh, either. So I can do all these exercises. On like how uh, much mobility you still have in your hands. So that when you do these exercises, you're not limited by someone uh, showing it um, who has more or maybe less uh, mobility in their hands than, uh, than you have. So we're trying to match that so that um, it really looks um, similar to, um, to how your hands may be affected by scleroderma. Um, and we've recorded these, uh, these videos with people living with scleroderma in uh, France, actually, by, uh, with Luc Mouton and uh, Joop Welling, a patient um, uh, advocate from the Netherlands, has, uh, has gone there to, uh, to help us record this video, uh, these videos. And it's really like, easy to follow. You can do this at home without a therapist. Um, and it shows you like, how to perform the exercises. It also tells you how often you should be trying this. And it also gives you some tips to avoid common mistakes. 
but you may think like, how, how exactly do I need to do this? And um, uh, you may be worried about like, maybe you're doing it incorrectly. So it really does show a clear video of how to do it. And then it has a transcript with some pictures uh, that show you uh, common mistakes and how to avoid those so that it's really like safe and easy to do uh, by yourself um, uh, at home at your own pace. What we know from these kind of toolkits is that they help best, of course, if you uh, actually do the hand exercises. If your doctor is prescribing you a pill and you're just leaving it on the nightstand, you're not taking it, it's not gonna help you improve probably. Um, and it's the same with like this spin hand, these kind of like exercises. So it really helps if you do them, integrate them in your daily routine, if you uh, conduct them uh, commonly, and uh, one of the things that we've built in in the Spin Hand Toolkit is actually a feature to set a goal for yourself. Because we know that setting a goal for yourself really can help you uh, maintain your exercise, your hand exercises routine. And you can share this with someone in your family or your, um, uh, your social circle so that they can remind you. Um, and if you've ever been like maybe like on a diet or trying to make another change in your behavior, it really helps if someone calls you uh, after a couple of days and is asking you like, hey, by the way, how are you doing with your diet or how is it going with your uh, smoking, uh, quitting smoking program? So this is uh, something that we've built in in the toolkit as well. Something else that we uh, heard quite a bit from the people who were involved in um, developing this, the, the people with scleroderma said, you know, Linda, it's nice if you tell me that I should be doing this. And it's really nice if uh, Dr. Mouton or, or another uh, a doctor is telling me I should be doing this. But what I really like to know is I would like to hear from others with scleroderma to see how it helped them and like what they are doing to, to improve their mobility, uh, etc. So we've also built in uh, a page where others would square them and share their story about hand functions and exercises that you can learn from each other uh, and uh, get the tips that they are using to improve their hand function and mobility. And then there's a lot of information um, and you have, as I said, time to look uh, at all of this in, uh, in more detail uh, when you log into the Spin Hand Toolkit. But we also have a page that actually goes through the most important problems that can occur uh, in, um, uh, in scleroderma when you have scleroderma, the problems that can occur with your hands. And this includes Reynolds phenomenon, uh, although I don't know if we have much to add to what Jen just uh, uh, explained, uh, swelling of the hands, but also things like contractures, uh, etc. So just that you can learn more about these problems that may be affecting your hands and get some tips on like how to uh, handle this and how to actually handle this maybe when doing the exercises as well. As you can imagine if you have an ulcer uh, on your knuckle, you're not going to uh, be bending it maybe like this because that may be painful. There's tips for these, um, uh, for these situations as well. And what I would actually like to do, and uh, I can't see you, but um, I am... Um, I hope that you will join me in actually like doing one of the exercises um, so that you get a real idea of what it is that we have included in this uh, program. And then the technical challenges, of course, that I need to um, switch my screen to the video. <laughs> um, and um, before this, I said like, oh, I did this multiple times already because I'm teaching a lot, but it's always a question whether this will work when you need it. There we go. Just, you can't see this yet, but I'm opening the video and then I will be sharing my screen. I know that I need to unplug. All right, so this is an exercise and I hope that you can still hear me. Um, this is an exercise that is uh, finger by finger bending. And this is exactly how it is presented on Spin's hand uh, website. So let me uh, start. So um, please um, join me in, in doing this exercise um, if you're uh, comfortable uh, uh, doing that. There we go. Start with your fingers straight and try to keep your knuckle joints straight. Bend your right index finger towards the palm of your hand, like a claw. If your finger does not bend all the way, 
Take your left hand and gently push on the nail to guide the index finger. Hold this position for five seconds. Straighten your index finger back out and then move the middle finger in the same way. Then the ring finger and the little finger. Each time, hold the position for five seconds. Next, do the other hand. Bend your left index finger toward the palm of your hand like a claw. Hold this position for five seconds. Straighten your index finger out and then move the middle finger in the same way. Then the ring finger and the little finger. Each time, hold the position for five seconds. Don't forget to keep breathing calmly while you are doing the exercise. All right. Um, all right. If you if you think that this may have uh, gone a little a little fast, maybe um, that's always like the first time you uh, you you watch this video. I think um, that is uh, that is fairly uh, common to think that. But of course, like as I said, you can usually like just you know pause it, um, watch it multiple times, um, uh, etc. So really at your at your own pace. Um, there's another video um, uh, that I won't show um, uh, right now, uh, but that you will find, um, and I think that is really important is about, you know, how to incorporate your hand exercise routine into your daily life. And this is actually Maureen Sauvé, who you may uh, know um, uh, from uh, um, from her involvement with the, with the Slurdama community, um, telling you like how important it is, like, but actually giving some tips also on um, uh, how to set a routine for yourself to actually do these exercises and maintain it in the long run. So doing it while cooking uh, or brushing, brushing your teeth or um, doing it again at a, at a certain point um, uh, of the day, um, daily, so that it really helps you improve a lot. Um, it's always unfortunate that I can't show you around on the whole spin hand website. Um, the good thing is that if you make create an account, if you log in, um, uh, and I will tell you in a little bit like how best to do that, you will get a tour of the um, of the website. It shows you exactly where to go, where you can find all of this information that I tried to provide you uh, in, a, in a nutshell. Um, so that it's really easy to use. You get some information on um, how best to use the program by setting uh, or going through a module, one module per week, uh, for instance. So it really guides you. Um, and you don't necessarily need anyone to help you with that. You can just use it by yourself. That said, um, what we really think uh, would be a useful thing also to do is to use it together with your physical therapist if you have one or with your occupational therapist. They can also register and use this free of charge and they can take a look at exercises that may be most suitable for you uh, and for your hand involvement specifically, whether it would be like the, the thumb um, uh, or the finger extension or uh, maybe you have lost mobility in your wrists and they can help you select the best exercises um, from the program and I work with you on that together as well. So how do you access the spin hand program? Well, um, here again is the, uh, is the website um, and I'm uh, pretty sure that Scleroderm Atlantic will provide this also with the um, uh, link to this, uh, to this webinar uh, on their webpage that you can just click on it. Um, and the, um, uh, the share program, we call the spin share. Uh, where we make these uh, in these tools accessible. We start with the hand function program that is accessible now. And the other ones that I spoke about, self-management, coping with emotions and stress and appearance change, they'll all come later um, in the next years. Um, if you're already a participant in the SPIN cohort, you can just use your SPIN cohort credentials uh, and log in to the tools.spinsclur.com website. You don't need to register or anything. If you are not a SPIN cohort participant, you can do a very simple registration where um, you register with your email address. Um, you confirm by going to your email uh, that you want to access the program and then you have free access um, to uh, using the program, unlimited uh, access. And as I said, your physical or occupational therapist or others that, who you know that it's Glerderma, please spread the word and tell them that this is available to use. 
if you would like to know more about SPIN in general, the projects that we're doing, like how we are involved with, uh, with the community, please follow our social media as well. Uh, we have Facebook and uh, Twitter, uh, where you can uh, find updates on our research projects. Um, and um, of course, also give us input on what you think we should be uh, doing next as the next uh, stages. So uh, we hope that you will um, join us there as well. So my final slide is just to thank you, first of all, for, uh, for being here with us uh, today, uh, for uh, thanking uh, Scleroderm Atlantic for the invitation to present the Spin Hand Toolkit, um, even though I know that it's short and uh, you may need a little bit more information uh, on like how to use it, you'll find that when you log in. Also our sponsors, uh, and uh, um, that includes the Arthritis Society, as well as the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, but uh, even more important, I think for us as a Spin, uh, group is uh, thanks to all the organizations who support our uh, SPIN initiative and um, help us make these toolkits available to, uh, to people um, living with sclerodema to be used. Thank you. Um, I think Barbara, you are muted right now. <laughs> Um, yep. There I go. Thank you very much, Linda. I'm sure everybody will get a lot of information out of what you've just presented. Everyone will be, they'll be trying to find SPIN online and join up, I'm sure. Really good information. Um, I, there is a question and answer period. I see there are a couple of questions up there now. Um, if you would like me to go in and see what these questions are, I will. Um, to Barbara, if you'd like. Um, okay. L O would be Linda, I guess. So this there, one. the first question we have is um, from Laura. Laura and, Simmons, I see it. Yes, and then it's for Jan there. If you want to go. Ahead. Oh, okay. Oh, Jan, do you pick the calcium dots out of your fingers? No, um, in fact, I have calcium deposits um, throughout my body and I find that leaving them alone and not trying to open them because that will bring infection is the best thing you can do. They can be surgically removed. Um, however, speak to your doctor about they could grow back. Okay, and our next question is from Luann. Um, she said, thank you for these great presentations. Will you have access to all of the slides after this webinar? Um, I don't know if I can answer it, but I'm happy to provide the slides uh, of today's uh, presentation. Um, and um, um, I don't know where Sclerodam Atlantic would be uh, putting them up, I guess, with like the link to the webinar rec yes, um, recording. They, yeah. yeah, they will be posted on Facebook and YouTube. Exactly. Perfect. Yeah, and then I'll make sure to send my slides over because I haven't done that yet. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, the next question is, how do I register for a cohort if I do not have a doctor to go through? Yeah, uh, excellent question. Um, uh, for the SPIN cohort, the first thing to do uh, if you would like to register is indeed go to uh, on our SPIN Sclero uh, website and see if you are um, actually um, seeing one of the doctors who are enrolling in our SPIN cohort. If that is not the case, you can contact us by email. And we do have a procedure set up that we can enroll you without going through a doctor. And one of the things that we do is we give you a call, we explain um, everything that you need to know about the cohort and the, um, um, how to participate. And we will also um, uh, ask a couple of questions about your scleroderma. So please do send us an email on, um, I can, um, oh, well, if you look at our website, I think that's easiest to find uh, contact information. It's a spingeneral at gmail.com, spingeneral at gmail.com. Thank you. The next question I believe is to Jan from Paulette. My fingernails have ridges and are constantly rough and peel off easily. Have you had this? And if so, what do you do? Yes, I have, my fingernails have changed dramatically. 
And um, first of all, I would not suggest going and getting a manicure. Um, the reason being is um, when they go to clean the uh, cuticle area, they could open up a wound there. As far as your nails are concerned, I just file them, keep them very short, and they be my nails have become very thick. Um, so I keep them as short as I can, and the ridges are just, there's nothing you can really do for the ridges. Just use vitamin E and keep your cuticles nice and moist, and you can always soak your hands in um, some, if, you, if, they're, if they're inflamed at all, the oatmeal soaks are great. But as far as the ridges, that's just a part of the nail changes. There's really not much that I know that you can do for that. Okay, and our next question is uh, an anonymous question. Um, is there any research on light therapy? Do either of our guests know here? I have done light therapy a few times. Um, there is, I can, I can tell you there's not enough clinical data but I have a holistic doctor that I go to in conjunction with my regular um, doctor and I sit in a light bed. And what it is, is you sit in the bed and there's different light waves that go through your body. And it's kind of, it puts you, they put meditation music on and I was doing it for an ulcer on my toe. And I felt that I'm not sure exactly what, but the time, being sedentary and meditating and listening to the music and absorbing the, the light did help me. There is other um, information out there about red light and white light and, and all that all. And there is, there's not a lot of clinical data. So I would try it if you want, um, just be careful because there are articles that say some of those lights can affect the brain I don't, I'm not, didn't happen to me unless someone's not telling me something. <laughs> but um, there's a lot of information. If you can find a doctor that does light therapy, I'd go see them, try it. Thank you. This next question is for Jan from Paulette. Um, it's use vitamin E pills or cream. Also, thank you so much for your girls for this very informative session. Okay, so she's wondering if you use vitamin E pills or cream. I, I break open the vitamin E tablet. Break it open. I break it open, I put it on my hands. And I have to tell you, which I forgot to say during the presentation, one of the things I do is to protect my hands if I don't want to wear Band-Aids because I find the glue very, it's adhesive and it can rip surrounding tissue. I take a glove and I cut the finger, the fingers off the glove. I know you can't see me, Barbara, you could probably see. And I make them into little covers for my fingers. And it actually keeps them warm. And at the same time, it protects the ulcer. But you wouldn't want to put the covers like this on an ulcer that's open. These are for dry ulcers that might be hurting you. And then after you put on your vitamin E on here or whatever you're going to use, they're protective. I think they're great. You could buy cotton gloves, cut off the, t cut off the fingers, and just put them on your fingertips. And um, it works for me. Very good. I don't see any other questions coming up at this time, but at this time, probably I'll take a minute just to announce that our next webinar is January 17th at 2 p.m. with the title Life with Scler Scleroderma. So we hope that you'll all be able to join us for that. And there doesn't seem to be any other questions coming in. I think that's all of our questions for now there, Barbara. I think it is, yeah. Um, all this information 
we can gather and the better, more information we can gather, the better we can understand and treat our symptoms. Hopefully everybody will have a safe and warm Christmas. Keep your hands warm, your feet warm. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. All right, and with that, I'm gonna wrap up the webinar. Um, thank you to everybody that attended and also to our speakers today and to Bart for hosting. Thank You're you. Welcome. You're very welcome. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.